Do you enjoy the conference so far? I do. I hope you do as well. So, my talk is up. As I, he's already said, it's a talk that should never exist, but let me tell you anyway. I will tell you about the motivation for this talk, the experiment that I was conducting to make this happen here, a demo that I've been programming, and my conclusion that I drew from this experiment. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm in the business of software and hardware development for a long time. At the same time, then the Voyager space probes were launched. My professional career was also launched. But this space probe came probably far more far along than I probably ever will. I'm also for three years now participating in the C++ language committee, mostly in the evolution working group, but also in tooling. So, whenever I look at social media like Reddit or Twitter, and talk about C++ or hear about C++, there are many people very vocal about the facts they know about C++, like all these stuff like, this is also, also particular segments of the community, the committee is too fast or too slow. Some say the committee is totally detached from reality, and probably C++ or free is the every, everything you ever will need in your programming life. The rest is just syntactic sugar. But is this really true? Yeah. At around mid-May, Phil Nash came up to me and was asking me if I could give a talk on his conference 10 weeks later, um, I should talk about modules once more. But I said, Phil, I don't want to give a talk at all this, in this year. I'm so occupied with so many other things. Um, I will not talk about modules once again, but I will talk about, let's figure out if this is really true here. Maybe I can come up with some application that I can present on the stage at your conference, and this should be probably doable in 10 weeks. So I did a reality check. Are these people really true with their assessment of the state of the C++ language? So I thought this demo application that I will be presenting should contain everything that I have no clue about. Core language features, library features, libraries from third parties that I've never been used before or totally failed at. And boy, did I fail on core routines just a week before. Uh, so I decided, yeah, I will bring many of the new C++23 features Coroutines, concepts, ranges in particular, infinite ranges, <coughs> and make all this stuff work as smoothly together as I possibly can. And there's a lot of stuff in here. If I fail in this experiment, I want to fail as spectacular as I can, hide under a rock and program only in COBOL any longer. So, this is the reason why I have come up with this talk named Contemporary C++ in Action. But what does contemporary possibly mean? Is it all the old standards that are so foundational to everything that C++ is about? It's the fabric that underpins everything that we do. Or is it possibly the Renaissance that was happening in C++11 and completed in C++14? 
Possibly, yes. But what about all the new bits and pieces, nuts and bolts that came with C++ 17? I couldn't live without them any longer. Is this contemporary? Or possibly the new Big Bang, as I understand it, that came with C++ 20 and C++ 23? I think it's probably all of them. You can't just say one particular version of C++ is modern, postmodern, or contemporary. And what does this in action mean? As I already said, I'm an engineer, and this demo code should sample my daily life. All this engineering stuff that I'm doing every day, like data collection, data processing, data visualization, real-time or near real-time networking, of course, library usage. We do a lot of uh, third-party libraries. We create our own, of course, and we do interface design. By the way, all the pictures that I have seen are machines and stuff that we are doing in our company with just 15 people in Germany. And the first one was an FPGA, where I have my own specially programmed and designed and microprogrammed DSPs that I do. And the last one is the largest machine that we ever built in a factory floor at a steel mill. This is the range of stuff that we are dealing with. So, as an engineer, I will start with a specification, what I'm going to do, and then implement this demo code. It is a client server application. The server waits for connections, look at a specific directory for all the files in there and figures out if these files are TIFF files with video in there and decode it and send it at the expected frame rate to a client. And if there are no TIFF files in there, at least we get some filler frames. And the client will, of course, connect to the server, receive these frames and present them in a GUI window on the desktop. The whole application should behave like an application in our systems do. So it has to handle failures and timeouts very graciously so that there's not just a crash of the application and a clean shutdown should also be possible through the user interaction. As expected, it has a lot of C++23 in here. It totally relies on C++20 and we want it may contain traces of compile time programming. A few things before. Assume all these using directives and namespace alias direct, uh, definitions are there. And the coding style is the style that we use in our company. It's heavily influenced by our German culture. I use a couple of libraries. First of all, the ASIO library. This is kind of semi-standardized because it's a reference implementation of the networking TS published in 2018. That library provides us asynchronous networking and asynchronous execution. I'm going to use the libav library, which is quite famous, that can handle all the media formats. I'm using the SDL library to draw the video content on the desktop and it provides a little bit of windowing as well. And the last part is a, just two functions from our in-house code base, in particular, a command line options parser. libav and SDL are C libraries, and this means the objects that are allocated by these libraries live on the heap. So you have all the usual problems with heap allocated object and as usual, also in C, everything has to be done manually. Has a lot of problems, of course, that comes from that. You all know that. This is the typical code that you would expect from using these kind of libraries. 
but I don't like this code. Instead, I want value types. Of course, this is what we want in C++. Dave Abrahams will give a talk later this week on this subject, so I don't want to go that much into it. To make that happen, I created a tiny library that exists of only one templated class that wraps these heap allocated C objects and combines them with the allocation functions and the the allocation free whatever functions and creates true value types out of that. By use of a heavy dose of concepts and requires expressions, the existence or non-existence of constructors, destructors, emplacement functions are derived by some kind of reflection of the signatures of these functions here. We get uniqueness, we get constness, we get, in particular, independence of these types and composability. So we can now write code like you see on the bottom. This is much simpler and probably less error prone. So let's come to the first part the video decoding. I use this wrapper library and create four value types out of it. One represents a decoder, one represents a media file, and we have decoded video frames and data packets used internally that are never empty and also support and use reference counting. The most important data structure here is how we represent our decoded video frames and what type of data do we send over the network. First, we have a frame header that has the usual properties that you probably expect. Notice these are bit fields and two of these bit fields are calculated at compile time, the sizes of them. We have a couple of property functions in particular, how many bytes do we need to represent the content of a decoded video frame and what kind of video frame do we have with a particular instance of this type. The most important part and property of this type is it's trivial, so we can relocate instances of this object by bit blasting it or sending this data over the network without changing anything, and this is um, what we actually want here. Pixels are just a chunk of bytes. So a complete video frame is just a header and this block of data with the pixels in there. We can create filler frames worth of a couple milliseconds duration, and we can actually construct these tabs from a decoded video frame returned from the libav library. Designated initializers from C20 come in very handy here and make this construction very expressive. Pixels are just a view into the allocated decoded bad bytes that exist in the um, frame object from the libav library. And this is the main function of the whole video decoding process. This make frames function takes a directory where all the files live in that we want to decode, and it returns a generator that produces video frames. For those of you who are not familiar what a generator is, it's actually a representation of a a range that, is, um, that sits in front of a coroutine that actually calculates and produces these video frames. I generate an endless stream of paths from an infinite directory iterator that iterates over this directory over and over and over again until the end of time. Each of these paths 
is then filtered by looking at the extension and uh, read out all the ex files with extensions that we are not interested in. In the first transformation stage, we try to come up with a file that represents and gives us access to the contents. And in the second transformation stage, I will try to come up with a decoder that can actually decode the contents of this open file. At the end of the view pipeline here, I get a pair of an open file and a decoder that are the result of this pre-processing. If we actually got a decoder from the second transformation state, I will print a nice log message on the console and yield all the video frames that come out of the decoding of a file with a decoder. If I didn't succeed in getting a decoder, I will just send out a filler frame worth of 100 milliseconds of darkness. This filter is fed by a compile time function that takes a compile time string and reconstructs at compile time a closure from the lambda expression in here that then can be used at runtime. Amazing, isn't it? Opening a file is, this is just cookbook FFmpeg example code re, uh, reformulated in value types. We tried to open this file and get a file, hand, a file object out of it and we accept it, but only if this is actually a file that contains GIF in there. And this is done by looking at the content and if it actually has a video stream and this is of type GIF, we accept it, otherwise we close the file. The decoder is then associated with this file. If we can find out now that it is not an still image, the three just uh, close the file if it's just an still image. Otherwise, if it's a real TIFF video in there, we open the decoder. If this is successful, I can now return my open file and my decoder to be caller. The decode core pro, uh, function takes this file and the decoder and returns another generator that creates these video frames and allocates some assets that's used in the full decoding process that is seen here. As long as we're not at the end of a file and can read data from it, we send these data packets to the decoder and ask if we can actually get a decoded video frame out of it. If this is true, we can yield it and create a video um, frame that has been shown before. If we look carefully with these value types, all the craft is removed from the example code that is on the FFmpeg um, website. We will notice this is just textbook 101 multi-rate digital signal processing. The only problem, what we are facing here, the result is produced in the deepest, innermost nested scope. How can we get the result out of this function here? Usually these examples in the textbooks don't talk about this problem because this is not as simple as it seems. You have to invert the control flow, come up with a state machine so that you can actually return the results of this decoding process through the return channel of this function. But we have C++20, we have coroutines, and can yield our results from the innermost scope through the CO yield statement here. And because of that, the compiler will throw us a state machine for free. 
this direct iterator is just all the boilerplate that you expect from an iterator. It has a special end iterator. It's this Sentinel tag type. Every time you compare an iterator with this tag type, we, we get a false. So this iterator will never come to an end. It will iterate until the end of the universe. These non-member functions begin and end are here to adapt this iterator to make it actually a range and also a viewable range. In particular, it's an infinite range. All this code here is a distributed state machine. 50 lines of code just to come up with a very simple operation. It took me an enormous amount of time to implement this with all the corner cases. And yeah, I should have done test-driven development once again. If you want to go fast, you need to proceed slow. These 50 lines of code can actually be replaced by a generator and a coroutine in 10 lines of code. So, the video decoding is done. Let's talk about the networking. And in particular, as I said, we, I work in an industrial environment and every IO operation must be protected by a timeout. We can't do without. Failures are just normal. Sometimes devices do no longer respond, so we have to take action on that. And so with a socket, for example, I have to associate it with a timer. In many cases, we implement this in the typical object-oriented manner. This is just an, a pseudocode of a structure that you might, might come up with. And we have a couple of operations in there, the callbacks, that can bring back the results of each of these individual operations, then they come back from the operating system to us. We also have to figure out what the outcome is uh, we have to handle. The mutual cancellation of the, of the concurrently running other operation, and we have to figure out how to come up with a result, even in the face that these uh, callbacks may be produced on different threads. This is actually possible in asynchronous e execution. So we have to have quite some difficult task for, for us to actually implement this. Usually it's done with a state machine. And we also need something to cancel these, all these outstanding operations if we are, for example, no longer interested in the outcome of these. So if you look at the, um, the signatures of these asynchronous operations here, we will typically see that all these operations take a callable that is called back from, then the operating system comes up with a result. It usually has some indicator of what has happened if the outcome is successful or there has been an error in there and of course, with a value that is produced if everything went smoothly. If you look at the call side, a possible implementation on the call side, maybe it's a lambda that will have to take a reference to the object itself that was the originator of these calls. And the other one, of course, too. Now we have these shared ownership and all the problems that may come in face of multiple threads writing some data in there. So how can we improve the situation? Let's do some small transformation steps here. First, let's pack these return arguments so we get now tuples. And in the next step, wrap these tuples into awaitables that are returned from these asynchronous operations. On the call side, everything is now very smooth. 
just go away and do a structured binding and get the results out of it. The only problem now, how to compose this. As Andreas told us last day, these away tables are highly customizable beasts, have lots of buttons to press and levers to pull, but this is really difficult. To me, this sounds more like a task for a library, and ACO doesn't let us down here. It actually has an operator for concurrent execution of asynchronous operations that takes the away tables that come out of them and combines them into an away table that gives us a sum type with either of these results. So that the call side is now extremely simple to implement. All the complicated stuff, the state machine and the handling of whatever, and the concurrency and the data races that are possible here are completely absorbed in this concurrent operation operator from the ACO library. Looking at a more realistic example of this thing object, we see it has to be allocated on the free store. Has a couple of operations in there. And this is only the definition. Implementation in the call side is in, isn't even shown here. With all the magic from the ACO library now, everything is just a function with a single line of code. I'm happy with that. And the call side also fits on this slide. This is just a coroutine that calls into this read, a timed read primitive. So the assets used here, the socket, the timer, and the data can be just put into the body of this coroutine. And this gives us a couple of very interesting positive features. These objects are never shared. They are contained within the body of a function. So all the problems with data sharing are no longer. The lifetime is totally clear. It reaches to the end of the function. And because we have a co-await in the, in the call into the timed read, we can actually make this timed read so that it borrows all the necessary assets from the coroutine um, body in the F function here. And this is perfectly safe. Even in the, f you have, you may probably see that in a asynchronous execution framework, the part before the suspension point may run on a different thread than the part after this suspension point. But we actually don't longer have to care about all this stuff. And this is the reason why the creator of ACU, Chris Kohlhoff, comes up with this quote. This is why C++20 is the awesomest language for network programming. I think so, this is totally true. But I threw in another piece a flatten operation that takes this variant, the sum types of the results of the individual operation, and flattens them into an expected that we have from C++23 now. For those of you that have never experienced or heard about these expected types, it's more like um, optional on steroids. You don't know, not only get the value, but also um, the reason why there possibly is no value in them. So the call side is now what they get, no longer a variant out of it, but um, a combination of a value type or alternatively the reason for disappointment. So I think C++23 is the even more awesome as language for C++ for networking programming. 
So how does it look like in code? We have these tuples from the return with our errors, with our results, and we want our signatures to return tuples wrapped in awaitables so that we can now morph the regular I.O. operations, uh, I.O. objects like sockets, acceptors, and timers so that they return now these particular awaitable types. I also have a function that can demote every kind of object into the sequence of bytes that make up their object representation. And as explained, I use expecteds that have an error code in the disappointment channel. And in the value channel, we get either the amount of data that has actually been successfully transferred, and in the other case, a socket. Now, with these in place, I can formulate my primitives that I'm going to use, a send operation with a socket and a timer and the data, of course, and it's just as shown before, the flattening of the concurrent operation. Similar with the receive operation and a connect operation that in this case returns not a size but an open socket. This flattening is done such that it takes this variant of the individual return types from either of these asynchronous operations, figures out what the actual value type is, and then visits the variant with a variadic, uh, generic um, lambda that maps each individual result tuple into um, um, and the uh, case of, of something is fishy, it will de return the, the error in there into the disappointment channel of the expected, or if we are successful, it will um, move the result out through the value channel of the expected. So, now we have our networking primitives in place. We need an Azure execution framework. And, and this leads us to executors. Hot topic in the standard. Azure implements executors. PO for free, to be precise. But I will not talk about executors at all. Instead, ASIO gives us an even higher level of abstraction, and these are execution contexts that are there as the primary interface to interact and execute a synchronous operation on this framework. I won't talk about this either, except for one feature. ASIO comes with a couple of services that are part of these execution contexts and are user-definable and extendable. I add a stop service with a stop source in there and make my execution context pretty similar to what a std JFRED is. JFRED executes synchronously. These execution contexts execute asynchronously, but the interface and the, the features in there are quite similar now. So now I have a means to terminate asynchronous operations from the remote. Let's look at the code. A stop service contains a lot of boilerplate and our stop source. I can add a stop source using these services to an execution context. I can pull it out again and I can ask for any object that has some kind of relationship to an execution context 
for the stop source in there by pulling the stop source out of the context that is related to this particular object. How is this implemented? I can take any type of object and ask for its properties at compile time. If it's an execution context, we know what to do. If it's an executor, the executor knows about the execution context. And if it's, for example, a socket that runs on an executor, can ask for its executor, and this can ask for the execution context. And if neither of these is true, well, let's throw the hands in the air. These decisions are all done at compile time. And so these functions generate code only for one of these branches. This allows me now to implement a function that can abort outstanding operations on a couple of objects, at least one of them, but possibly more. And this function returns a stop callback that watches out for this stop source. And whenever a request, a stop re is requested, it will execute a piece of code that is capable of aborting these operations. And this is implemented using a C17 fold operation over a sequence of calls that are actually just a facade in front of the actual operations required to do it. This facade is necessary because of syntactic reasons. And this facade on aborting each or any kind of type is also done by figuring out which of the following operations can be done on this object. Do we need to use a, clo a free function called close that can handle this object? This close function can be found by argument dependent lookup or has it a close member function or has it a cancel member function? We're happy with either of these. If none of this is possible, yeah, we, can com we complain a bit. So this was the third piece from the requirements list earlier before. Now we can actually abort outstanding asynchronous operation whenever we need to. This Excuse me. The second half of this executor part is how to create one with all these capabilities. I take an XIO context and a stop source and add this stop source to my IO execution context. And then return a closure that can take a piece of work and a couple of arguments and figure out if this piece of work must be called asynchronously, then push it onto, onto the asynchronous execution framework. If it needs to be called synchronously, invoke it immediately. And if neither of these works, yeah, we know how to complain. So, I have my networking primitives. I have an executor that can handle all the operations that I need to execute. I have my video decoder. Now I can implement my server. <coughs> the server is just a call, a function call that takes such an IO context, a couple of endpoints, and the directory to observe. For each of the endpoints in this list, I create a task that accepts connections and uses an acceptor 
that listens on this particular endpoint. This task is now the owner of this acceptor object. So I have to place a watchdog in here that will abort all further operations on the acceptor when a stop is requested. As long as the acceptor is open, it will accept connections from the clients and create a new task that is supposed to stream videos through this object, a fruit socket. The streaming video task is now the owner of the socket and it immediately creates a timer for the actual sending operations. And because we are now the owners of the socket and the timer, we have to place a watchdog that takes care of both of them. I have a starting gate kind of thing to make sure that each of these frames are sent out at the correct time with the correct frame rate. And here we have the other side, the call side of our video decoder. Remember, this function returns a generator that produces decoded video frames on demand. Every time you pull a video frame out of this range, it will come up with the next decoded video frame. It then waits for the correct amount to send it out, has a gather list with the header and the pixels in there, and sends them out through the socket within a given send time budget. If everything is fine and dandy, we continue this, press, this process as long as we get decoded video frames, which is forever. In case of a problem, we break out. This stop gate is just a closure returned here that looks at a particular frame, starts a timer and returns an awaitable um, that, is, that can then be co-awaited on in the call side. This is the whole server. So what we have here is a stage set up by our execution context. And we have a couple of individual independent agents that are operating on this stage. We have acceptors, one for each of the endpoints, and each of these acceptors will create new agents that handle the connection that are coming in from the clients. Each of these agents operate completely on their own. Nothing is shared here. So this means we can scale this as much as we want. We can have as many acceptors as we like. We can have as many connections as we like. We are just limited by the resources of the machine that is, um, the situation is running on. Nothing is shared, as I said, so we don't have to even think about stuff like new taxes and similar bottlenecks that you can introduce here. We can have as many threads that this is running on. Nothing needs to, is no longer our concern. With the, sub, with the server implemented, let's look at the client side. Here, the task that is actually in charge of showing us the videos. This task is also running on the same execution context. It takes a GUI window and a couple of endpoints that the client could connect to. 
if we get a successful connection pass all our current assets like the socket, the timer, and the GUI window onto the core player. Then the core player is done, like for example, the user has pushed the close button of the GUI window, we request the stop of the whole application. Here is the core player with the socket, timer, and the window. And once again, we have to place a watchdog in here to abort all operations on the socket and the timer. And I also have put a memory resource in here that gives us the um, buffer of, that you can receive pixels into. While the socket is open, we try to receive a frame. And if this is successful, we update the dimensions and the shape of the GUI window and draw the pixels onto this window. We also lock what we have actually received from the server to the console. The reception of a single video frame may come up with a well-formed frame that has visible content, it may have invisible content, and it may be something that indicates a failure. We borrow the necessary assets because we are strictly nested into the column, set up a, um, a portion of bytes that they can receive the header into with the correct size and the correct alignment and receive the header. If this is successful, we can now reanimate the header object that is represented by these bytes that we have returned from the network. Now we have a valid header frame header object within its lifetime. We kindly ask our memory resource for a chunk of bytes that is the right size that is advertised through the header. And we actually have video content, receive it, and slice off all the pixels that we have successfully received. Remember, this got is an expected, and we have this value or operation that comes in <coughs> Very handy here. If the received bytes with the pixel contents in there as advertised in the header, we can return a full video frame. Otherwise, we have to say, sorry, no picture for you today. The next part is the GUI. It's implemented by the SDL library, as already mentioned before. We get some value types, window, renderer, and a texture. We have some strong types to tell about the width and the height of these GUI windows, and have a class in the typical object-oriented manner that is so popular in everything GUI. We can create a GUI window. We can update the dimensions according to the information contained in the video frame header, and we can present the bytes. Well, we have the usual composition in there. There's nothing very special about it. The composition is, of course, very easy because we have values, full value types. The constructor is totally boring. Let's look at the update operation. If there's no content in the header advertised, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 
we update our GUI window only on the first frame in a sequence that is coming from decoding one particular file. If there's no content in there, we just hide the window in our case, update all the information and create a new texture and show the window. The presentation of the pixels in there is we lock the texture that is living in the video memory into, to make it accessible through the, uh, through the CPU, push all the pixels onto this texture, unlock it and render, uh, put it into the renderer to present it on the, on the desktop. We also have the typical event loop that we, we you, you find in every kind of GUI framework here as well. And we look out for quit events that come from close, uh, pushing the close button. And the last missing part is event handling from either the terminal that will look out for a couple of signals. This is also an ACO IO object that needs to be aborted in case of um, a closure of the, uh, of a close request of the application. We can await it and, yeah, initiate an application stop. The same from the GUI, and this time it's just pulling the event loop from the GUI and the stop. So far, we have the decoder, we have the server, we have the client, we have all the event handling. Let's make an application out of it. We call our command parser and get a media directory and a server name out of it and translate the server name and the port into a couple of endpoints and place, finally, our execution context here. And, of course, the stop source. These are the only parts in this application that are shared between all these agents. These are the stage that I'm setting up. To put all the agents on this execution context, I make a scheduler out of it as seen before, and start the server to serve. If this is successful, I start my video player, my client, with a new GUI window and a list of server endpoints, and also the handler for events from the terminal and the GUI. So this is the complete picture of the application. We have our stage with all the actors on, acceptors, connections, the video player, the actor that handles terminal events, and the actor that handles GUI events. So what you've seen, what are the signature features of this application, stuff that I've never been using before. Generator, expected, print line, stop source, stop token, stop callback, all the nice stuff from C++20. Of course, a lot of spans, ranges and views, in particular infinite ranges, I used a lot of context and even more requires expressions, coroutines, structured bindings, fold expressions. I have compile time decisions, compile time functions, and a primitive form of compile time reflection. In particular, I use value types strong types, compiler-generated closure types, 
and compiler-generated state machines. But where all these were the, the important parts to compose the function and the operation of the application. But there is one more compositional aspect in here. And this is the source code, composition. If we look at the main translation, main translation unit, and on the, top, on the top of it, we will see this uses the modularized standard library a module that contains the stuff from our in-house code base, a modularized ACO library, and a couple more named modules that are part of the whole application. The whole module structure here is not only that one seen in the slide before, Within the project, there are six named modules. One cross plot, uh, project header unit. Gabby will probably cringe, but um, I made it so. I have a couple of pre-compiled and cached modules. Four named modules from external libraries. ASIO, Boost Program Options, LibAV, and SDL. And of course, the modularized standard library. In fact, every module translation, trans, translation unit types that is described in the C20 standard is implemented here and shown as an example. We don't have to look at the particular features. I have given talks on that the years before. Just a few examples how these modules look like. This one is from our in-house library. It contains, it's just a single file module on the left. It has the module purview with the exports and a private module fragment with the implementations of the exported functions. It uses another module, Boost Program Options, that provides us the command line parser. This is also a very simple module. It contains of only one function but this time with a, with a global module fragment that includes the header from this boost library. And in unfortunately very boosty manner, more than 24 other boost libraries. This is probably in terms of source code size the largest translation unit here. The STL library is also modularized, but this is a little bit more complex. It has a global module fragment and the module purview with the exports here. But in this case, it also uses module interface fragments to handle all the macro definitions that are part of the interface of the SDL, SDL library. It's kind of ironic that I have to use X macros to get rid of all the macros in here. These turn all the uh, macro definitions in the interface into property, uh, uh, proper language entities that I can actually export. Usually this is just a const export variables that have the same value as the, as the macros. And 
lastly, the standardized, uh, the modularized standard library is also extremely simple. It's just a single file module which has the unwrapped C headers in the global module fragment and the C++ standard headers and the wrapped C headers that are exported through the named module. I'm using the header files of the standard library that Stefan T. Labor, Loverway, this is who is the maintainer of the, um, of the Microsoft standard library and has done all the work to make this happen in the, for an upcoming version of the, um, the Microsoft modularized standard library. And I compiled it here to present it today. What does it bring us? I tried to figure out how much faster is it to provide the complete API of the C++ standard library through a module in comparison to including all of them. It's just about bringing in all the definitions and declarations. In case of an include, this takes about two seconds on my development machine. And this has a bit over 120,000 lines of pre-processed code. If I compile it as a module, either by re-exporting imported headers or in a proper named module manner that exports only the stuff that has to be visible, I get huge benefits importing this API. Even the slowest one is at least 100 times more faster than including the header files from the standard library. And the BMI, the resulting BMI from compiling the standard library in module form is about the same size as the textual representation is. I think this is a testament for, for the benefits of providing the C++ API through a module. This is consistent. Last year I've been showing the same with the modularized format library. It's just the same um, ratios that come out of this and with that, let's head over to the compiler and let's figure out if this is just pipe dream or if it compiles. I will compile the whole application. In release mode. This is an extremely slow computer, barely capable of even running this. E IDE here. And let's start it. Something happened here. The program was listening on two endpoints, but did nothing more. 
Does anybody have an idea what's wrong? No. I've just set up the scene. This is what I've been showing in the, in the slides before. I need a thread to execute this execution framework. Compile it again. And start it. So, it's not just a pipe dream. <laughs> and I can stop it as expected. So my conclusion from this experiment is contemporary C++ is simple. I think this code was not complicated. It is concise. Just few lines of code to make this stuff happen. It is safe because of the composition of it, using coroutines in particular. It is composable not only on the functional side, but also on the source code side. And therefore, I think it is enjoyable. And this is my definition of what contemporary C++ is. At this point, I want to give a huge thank you to all of the C++ committee for all the work that I've done in the past 20 years or so to make this actually happen. I want to give a shout out to Hartmut Kaiser that this 2015 keynote at Meeting C++ that has changed how I think about programming and using execution frameworks, executors, or something similar, instead of threads. And also, at the same conference, there was this promise, uh, promise import stood. And this is now reality. And I think this will change the shape of C++ programming. Another huge shout out to Stefan T. Laboway for doing all the work to make this happen, to Cameron, the Camara, for the compiler to make this happen, for Gabriel Dos Reis and Bjarne Struhstrup for their work more than 10 years ago on the IPR project that will hopefully shape the landscape of tooling and it's also the underpinning of the BMI implementation of the Microsoft compiler. And of course, an even more huge shout out to 
Chris Kohlhoff, the author of the ASIO library. This is one of the libraries that has been absolutely foundational to all the code that I write for more than five years now. There are no more threads in my code and there are no more mutexes in my code. Here are some links for information and videos that you might want to look at. Also the GitHub repository with this demo code in here. And with that, I'm done and ready to take questions. Um, I didn't quite understand where the C underscore resource is that something that you took from somewhere or something that you wrote? Or? This is something that I wrote, but I didn't show here oh. because it has so many concepts and requires okay. and compile time stuff in here. I didn't want to make you run away. <laughs> okay. We have two questions online. The first one is from Ivan. How much time did it take to compose this client server demo? I said in the beginning I had a time frame from about 10 weeks. Then Phil Nash came up to me to have an idea and figure out what I could do to present on his um, conference C++ on C. And this took me, well, probably one hour per day over the course of eight or nine weeks because at the beginning, there's the usual process of procrastination. <laughs> the second question is, how did compile slash runtime debugging go relative to your experience using C++ pre, C++ 20, and 23? <laughs> as smoothly as you can expect. The debugger in here is totally capable of handling this particular kind of code, in particular call routines. Um, just a comment, uh, thanks. Uh, this was mind blowing and it was particularly nice to see how the variety of features that uh, are in C++ 20 and uh, 23 can work in combination. That is one of the hardest design tasks, especially for a, a large committee. So I was very, very pleased. Thanks. Thank you very and much for this. The, and thanks to the committee. Hey, uh, forgetting run, classic mistake. Um, also, I didn't quite understand how the watchdog worked. You declared that, and then it didn't look like you used it anywhere. So what does that do? I was just placing this uh, stop callback into the function body. And this uh, stop callback object placed in there monitors the stop source in the execution context. That's all about it. OK, I'll have to look at that later. Yeah. We received another question online from Andrew Stern. What steps were needed to make ASIO a module? Um, <laughs> Actually, not that many. What you usually have to do if you take an existing piece of code is to get rid of all the um, all the um, statements and um, function definitions and all of this kind of stuff that cannot be exported. For example, if you have translation unit local entities that are unnecessarily so, you usually have some kind of static definitions in there, static functions, for example, or static variables. 
just get rid of the static, and now you can put it into the purview of a module, and you get the same effect because a module is compiled only once you don't need these static declarations in here. This is the, the first thing you, that you have to do to use existing code and make it into a module. There are probably a little bit more involved here, but as I said, I have actually set up this demo code as a, um, as a particular use case to show all things that you need to do and you probably want to know about modules. <laughs> I really would see that all the other compilers and build systems come to a point that this is actually implementable. As far as I know, there's only one compiler and one build system that can express this and compile this. If you really want to go into modularizing existing code, you should probably learn a little bit more about modules. I've given talks about that. And you probably run into um, particular ways to express things in particular ACO with this concepts emulation here that brings your compiler to the knees. ACO is, ex is really a kind of a library that is at the brink of breaking the MSVC compiler, but it survives so far. I hope this answers the question. It's not as easy as it usually is if you start with a new module. New modules are just writing as you use, or as you would in your daily work or in your hobby. This is a piece of cake, but making existing code into modules is a little bit more involved and you should have a little bit of experience in doing so and not, not really start with ACO. Um, I have a question about the composed operation that you were showcasing with the logical OR. Uh, so, for example, you have this timed read uh, where you have two asynchronous operations at the same time, and then you just go wait on the composed operation. Say the read succeeded and you have a timeout sitting somewhere. Don't you need to cancel that? How do you, or is it just what happens with the other side? Yeah. Um... This is the beauty of this operator. Every, com every piece of complexity is completely absorbed in the implementation of this operator. This is a coroutine on itself. And as a user, I don't even want to know how this works, as long as it works. If you are more interested, look at the sources from ACO and probably ask Chris to explain it to you, I can't. Thank you. Hey, I think this was a great example of uh, the progress C++ made. Doing this 10 years ago would have been quite a nightmare. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> at the same time, the competition in the industry is also moving forward. For example, a problem similar to this would be uh, solved by Go or Python. How do you think this comparison can show us the progress that C++ has done and how it compares in the industry when making choices for the tools to pick to solve the hmm. uh, issues? Well, my problem is I have no comparison to Go or Python because in our company we use only C++ and nothing but C++. So I have no experience in implementing such kind of thing in Go or Python. I'm sorry. Any more questions? Well, then enjoy your day. <laughs> <laughs>